I'd like to have you look with me in Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25. One part of me says just stand up and read this and sit down and be quiet because it seems that when we read the entire chapter some of this is so plain and apparent that uh, we should understand it. But the other part of me says to do what the Lord has ordained every one of his preachers to do, and that is to stand up and read it and declare the glory of Christ. Preach Christ and him crucified. Anybody that's ever stood here, I believe, understands a little bit of that struggle. How can you say it any clearer than what the Lord has already said it? <laughs> and yet, he ordains us to stand up here and declare it. But my prayer is that the Lord would cause you to hear his word. And may anything that I have to say not get in the way. Because that is what you need to hear, is his word. So I pray to that end. I'm going to read the entire chapter. We'll probably just look at verses 1 through 5 for today. But I want you to see the entire context. And I want to speak with you on God's truth and faithfulness. Both of those are vital. God's truth and faithfulness. It says in verse 1, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So that's where the title comes from, faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a heap, of a defensed city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. So what we see here concerning our God, you notice how the writer puts it, O Lord, thou art my God. And when it says there, thou hast done wonderful things, how do people usually use the word wonderful? It's when something exciting happens. Well, here's something exciting that has happened. God has exercised his right to destroy sinners. How many preachers do you hear preaching that way today? This is a wonderful thing. But God in his justice has taken a city and made a heap out of it. That he has taken a well-defensed city in that day, take the best that there was, and what did he do? Brought it to ruin. You say, well, how is he glorified in that? Exalting himself, showing his glory, even above the wisdom of men. That ought to rejoice our hearts. But you know, we live in a day where people defend men. They think, well, that's not right. Or, you know, why would God do that? Well, he's holy. He's just. These are his attributes that whether men agree to it or not, yet he's God in so doing. And he's faithful. You see how these attributes come together. He is faithful and true in doing so. You know, some things are right because God does them, and that's the only explanation. Other things are God does because they're right. But either way, he's God. He's God. A palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. If God causes sinners to believe a lie and leaves them in their darkness and the condemnation, there's not a one of them that's ever going to discover the truth. They'll be left to their own devices. But 
Verse 3 says, Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. Why? For thou hast been a strength to the poor. See what we're reading here? Is it not God's right to condemn? Is it not his right to raise up? Strengthen whom he will. A strength to the needy in his distress. A refuge from the storm. A shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. And here's a verse that you ought to be familiar with. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord will wipe away tears from off all faces. And there we understand the faces of the remnant, the faces of those that he has been pleased to preserve by his grace and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it and it shall be said in that day lo this is our God I've had some tell me in their rage that might be your God but that's not my God well you're right <laughs> this is our God we have waited for him, and therefore we wait, and he will save us. I've had some say, well, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket like you're doing. You know, it's better to diversify. Try a little this, try a little that. Well, we'll wait for him. His work that he's accomplished, and you know what? He will save us because salvation is in him. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We're not sitting around wondering. We'll rejoice. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill, and he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. Don't you love illustrations from Scripture? Just imagine a swimmer just stretching forth his hands to swim, just gliding through that water. Nothing inhibiting, nothing stopping, just moving. The wake behind him. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. But what we see here concerning God's truth and faithfulness, I believe is pretty, pretty evident. He's true and faithful in his judgments, but he is true and faithful in how he saves sinners. Both of those are vile. And so what we have here in verses one through five is a song of praise. I know we normally think of the Psalms as being where we go for the hymns to sing praises to the Lord, but throughout the scriptures there are hymns, there are songs of praise. There's the song of Moses in Exodus, isn't there? Of course you've got the psalmist, but then throughout the prophets you see in the midst of darkness because if you look at the chapter previous, it's speaking there of nothing but condemnation, the Lord bringing judgment. And after all of those threatenings of his wrath in, that, in the foregoing chapter that we saw in verse, the chapter 24 now, it opens up to a song 
of praise. And I see it, if we could go through the whole chapter in one setting, divided really in three parts. Here in verses 1 through 5, thankful praises for what God has done for the sake of a people, for the sake of his son. And these praises are offered up to God. And so we learn to give praise and thanks to God. You know, the scriptures say, in everything give thanks to the Lord. Not just when things are going like we imagine they ought to, but even in difficult times. In verses six through eight, we see some precious promises, praises and promises of what God would yet further do for his people, those that he's chosen by his grace, and especially the grace of the gospel set forth. When it talks about in this mountain, what mountain do you suppose it is? It's talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about where he put his temple. All the nations all around that temple being placed there as a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. So the precious promises, the, the, the feast of fat things that's prepared. And when it says he'll destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. What is that but the condemnation of the law? That which condemned them, the blindness, the Lord would remove it in this mountain. To me, that's a very clear declaration, even here in the Old Testament, of the place and the time where God would be pleased to save his people. It is through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verses 9 through 12, the triumph in God, in Christ, of the Lord's people over their enemies. So a real hopeful chapter as we look at it. But I want to come back to verses 1 through 5, not to rush through it, and talk to you about God's truth and faithfulness as we see it here in this song of praise. We see in verse 1 how Isaiah is given these words. And I don't believe anybody can truly honor God, rejoice in Him, particularly in the face of condemnation and judgment, unless the spirit of grace has been given to understand these things and to bow and to give God the glory. Even when he is pleased to destroy rather than to save. I think most men we talk to assume that God ought to save everybody. But we know differently. If he saves any, that's his grace. If he condemns, that's his right. That's his justice in doing so. But here, the prophet in verse 1 determines to praise God himself. And I, I would add there whether others will praise him or not. How much of our praising of God is tempered by whether other people say so or not. Do you ever find yourself in that situation sometimes being quiet because you think, well, if I say something here, why not? If it's to the glory of Christ, say it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And that's really what he said, O Lord, thou art my God. You and I have been in situations where you're, you're forced to say something. You just cannot let it go. Well, how do you begin? Well, let me tell you about my God. When you say that, you are distinguishing auto automatically with one statement what they've been saying and what you know to be so. But say it. Let me tell you about my God. O oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee in distinction to any other God that men worship, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. I will be clear. I will be careful to make sure that when we're through, you understand the difference, whether you believe it or not. 
You know, you remember Peter in Acts 3, put in the situation with that Sanhedrin. Imagine 70 of the highest officials in religion of that day all sitting there with Peter in that assembly and asking him by whose name this lame man was made whole. He could have said, by Jehovah God, and gotten out of there scot-free. But he said, by Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have taken and crucified. What was he doing but distinguishing his God from any that they believed in? You see, those that have the Lord in truth for their God are bound to praise him. To me, this is where the difference falls or lies between mere profession and true revelation. There are certain things that, as the Lord has taught you, you cannot deny, and you will not, because it is your life. It's, it's, it is it's, uh, difficult to try to hold your breath than not to speak, not to say anything. And I believe that that's what Isaiah is expressing. You know, in praising God, I know today there are these praise services, but in praising God, we exalt him. You see the, the connection? I will praise thy name. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. You do not praise God. You do not give him the glory if you put in any way your will or your works in the same breath or sentence or even in the same thought, whether you say it or not, is God himself. He is all. We are nothing. So in praising God, we exalt him. We can't make him higher than he is. That's not what it means to exalt any more than to sanctify his name means to make him holy. We don't, we don't make him holy in sanctifying his name. But we make him to, to be before men and in our own hearts who he is indeed. If you look in Exodus chapter 15, you'll see one of these hymns just like here in Isaiah, a song of praise. Here's the song of Moses that I referred to a little while ago. Look how it begins. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. Why do most people like singing today? I'm talking about even choirs, congregational singing. It makes them feel better. They get something out of it. They're wild. And singers, even though they say it's a you know, so-called Christian hymn, they, they, they sing it because they like the applause. It's a production. It's like an artist, just like an actor. But here, there's no thought of man or any glory of man. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song, notice, unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So again, same sort of context, isn't it? It is Isaiah 25. What is he being praised for? Destruction. The fact that sinners, by God's right and justice, have been cast down. And then verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song, and he is become my salvation. He is, notice this word again, my God. Whether anybody else acknowledges him or not, he is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So, that's the first point of this song of praise, that determination to praise God himself, whether others will praise him or not. Something that we, day in and day out, by God's grace, determine to do, give him all the glory. But secondly, coming back here to Isaiah 25, 
we see the prophet Isaiah. Now you have to remember, <laughs> you talk about living in a day of unbelief. You know, the Lord, remember that when he first raised him up, told him he'd send him forth to, to a people who would see but not see, would hear but not hear. The Lord had purposed a hardness. And in the midst of this, nonetheless, he was to declare God's glory. So we find, I do, here, the prophet himself, this one. Maybe there were some others that we don't know about, but at least this one who comforted himself with the, with the thought that God would do his work in destroying the wicked and preserving his own. We see both of those here in verses one through three, the destruction of the wicked. Is God right in doing so? Well, if you have a problem with it, then you have a problem with God. Yes, he's right in doing so. But at the same time, it's not total despair because we see in verse four, thou hast been a strength to the poor. And so Isaiah is comforted in this. While men get upset, while men argue with such a God, the Lord's people find comfort in it. Comfort in that harmony that there is between God's faithfulness and truth. You can have truth without faithfulness. Uh, there's probably a lot of truth in some of the bylaws of some of these old congregations. You, you know, some people say, well, go back and read what this, this organization used to stand for. It doesn't matter. You know, there might be truth there, but if there's no faithfulness to it, it's just a piece of paper. On the other hand, you can have faithfulness without truth. You can be faithful in attending places of worship. You can be faithful in going out and knocking on doors every week. You can be faithful in giving. And this is the message that we hear today. Be faithful. But there's no truth. There's no knowledge or understanding of Christ. One without the other is of no value. Here, Isaiah says of God, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. When he talks about his counsels of old, what's he talking about? What he's decreed. What he's purposed to do. It shall stand. And whatever he has decreed or purposed, it is according to his faithfulness that it'll be accomplished, and it is according to the truth, because God can do nothing other than what is true and faithful. And that's, that's his comfort. You know, if the Lord brings you or me through a hardship or a difficulty, you may not understand how this all fits as far as your own life is concerned. He might be pleased to turn it all upside down here in a second. But the one thing <clears throat> that I know, if you're the Lord's, it'll be a comfort to you, is that God is true and ordained it and he's faithful to what he says he'll do. Even if you can't explain even other, one other little detail of it, he's true and faithful. That same reality is, is true in, in the condemnation of sinners. You know, when people ask you, how is it that a loving God can send people to hell? What do you answer? He's true and faithful. It might not be an answer that they like, but it's so. He's true to his righteousness. You know what? God loves his righteousness. And he's true to his honor. He will not in any way lower his standard in order to save a sinner. He is a God of love, but he loves his righteousness. But you know, based on that, what I can tell you, there's not one in hell that he's loved. If he loved them, they wouldn't be there because he's true and faithful. See, that's where your hope is. That's where mine is. is that if, if he spares me, it'll be because he's true 
to his honor and glory. He's true to his son. And if his son paid that debt, there is therefore now no condemnation. He's faithful to that. And that's why it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Whoever confesses their sin, I don't mean just confessing this sin or that. That whole verse has to do with confessing who I am before holy God. Undeserving of grace. Undeserving of salvation. Who, who is it that ever confesses that but one taught of the Spirit? And if I'm brought to confess who I am, he's, he's faithful and just to, to forgive. He's faithful to his son. The scriptures say that all, Christ said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Who's going to come? All that the Father given, has given to him. And if I come, what's my hope? That he's true and faithful. I wouldn't come except he drew me. And if he drew me, I have this confidence that he'll never cast me out. Never. He's true and faithful. So you see, that's the comfort. But at the same time, we give him the glory, whether it's in condemnation or whether it's in salvation. He's true and faithful as it pertains to our own acquaintances, as it pertains to our own children. You know, Christ said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. A number of us are living this right now in our own homes, in our own families, in our own ancestry. You go for a whole generation, and then suddenly the Lord plucks you out and then passes by another whole generation. Why me? He's true and faithful. It says there, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. In other words, if he was pleased to save you, it was because of what he purposed to do from eternity. He's true and faithful in that regard. But he's also true and faithful in his destruction, as we see here in uh, verses 2 and 3. For thou hast made of a city in heap. Is he, is he right in doing so? Absolutely. Right in doing so. Thirdly, in this song of praise, I believe that uh, he's given us what ought to be and what is a matter of praise. If I were to say to you, let's sing a song of praise, what would be the content of it? How would I know? Is it just because it's a feel-good song? You know, we, we're, we're feeling good about God today. Let's give him the praise. No. There's some sub substance to it. And we see it here. First of all, in verse 1, he has done wonders according to the counsel of his own will. You know, we exalt God. So that means a song of praise gives him all the glory. Our hymn book has a lot of hymns in there, but you notice we don't sing them. I'd invite you to, if you want, take one home. Just make sure you bring it back. Kind of read through it. Browse through it. Look at some of these. I've got one at home that's got X's through it. Just draw a line. You know, read it and look at it. It's not necessarily that there's blatant error in it. The curse words or something bad, but there's no substance. There's no acknowledging of God for who he is. We exalt God by admiring who he is and what he has done. Whether it's in condemnation or in how he's pleased to show grace to sinful creatures such as we are. That's what Isaiah the prophet calls here wonderful things. A wonderful thing is, is beyond our understanding. Truly to use that word, wonderful. Beyond our, our comprehension. Is there anybody here that can say when it's all said and done that they understand God's counsels? You know, who is man that he should even 
say that he understands God's counsels or understands how it is God will, will work and direct at any given time or in any given person. We don't know these things. But either way, when it's all said and done, he's wonderful. He's to be glorified. He's to be praised, whether he reveals Christ in a heart or whether he passes by that sinner. He's to be praised. And all of his works of providence, you know, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but like it says, we know who holds tomorrow. And we know that anything that takes place will be exactly according to to what he purposed. We saw that in our Bible class this morning. The blind man. Why was he blind? God purposed it. You know, in John 9, there was a blind man. They were trying to figure out who sinned. Did he? Did his parents? You know, people are trying to figure out. The Lord just simply said, it's for, it's for God's glory for this hour. What did that blindness do? It had him in a place where Christ would cross his path. And that, again, was to his honor and glory. So that's the first thing concerning uh, a song of praise, substance-wise. It gives God all the glory. But secondly, as we see in verse 2, it humbles man. That which gives God the praise and the glory doesn't put man up on an equal pedestal. Now we're going to give man equal time. We praise God, now let's praise man. No. That which glorifies God humbles Man, his pride, and he thought of power. You can see who's directed, who's the object of God's wrath here in verse 2. It's the strong, supposedly. Who else builds a city? But what they think were, were strong. A defensed city, a ruin. That's God's purpose. If we're to glorify him, man is to be abased. And then thirdly, in a hymn of praise, I'm thankful that there's mercy. There's mercy. You know, if, I, if all I had to do was stand up here and tell you God is just in condemning sinners, what hope would there be? He'd be right. He'd be right in condemning every one of us in this room, myself included. He'd be right. And my mouth would have to be stopped. But you know what? We find in this song of praise a message of, of hope. To what kind of people? A distressed people. It says in verse 4, For thou hast been a strength to the poor. Have you come poor and needy today? That's, uh, that's who this message is. Addresses, thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy. There's, it's an interesting way that this is put here in Scripture because on the one hand we have God weakening the strong that are proud and secure in their thinking, bringing them to ruin. And yet on the other hand we find him being the strength of the weak, that yes, he has so humbled to bring to that place, and yet at the same time is their strength. Notice, he not only makes them strong, but it says he himself is their strength. He was made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that they that glory, let them glory in the Lord. I don't know if you appreciate that. Not that he just makes me strong, but he is my strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Christ strengtheneth me. Christ is my strength. It's not a matter of him giving you some tools to strengthen yourself. You know, without him, we are nothing. Without his blood, I have no forgiveness. Without his righteousness that he worked out and was imputed there at the cross, I have no righteousness. He is all my righteousness. Without him and his work, 
I have no peace. So as he is my strength, so is he my refuge. You can see that in verse 4. All of this goes together. A strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is a, as a storm against the wall. All of this is Christ and Christ alone. All the glory belongs unto him. Whatever dangers or troubles that the Lord's people may be in. And what does that tell you? We can expect trouble. Our Lord said that. In the world you shall have tribulation. There's not going to be any peace in this world. But we know this, that because of Christ and his finished work, there's nothing that can hurt us. Nothing that can destroy us. Because God has purpose in truth and faithfulness otherwise. And I have a picture of me standing next to this poisonous snake that uh, when we were up in Chicago at the Museum of Science and Industry, they got, they got this whole section of snakes, if you like snakes. And uh, I was brave. I went and put my head right up next to one of these snakes that was sitting there on this thing, just right there, smiling away and got the picture taken. You know, I say, well, why weren't you afraid? Well, he's on the other side of the glass. <laughs> I wouldn't have been so brave that I'd been in there trying to feed him or catch him. But I was, on, I was on the right side of the glass. There was no way in this world that thing could ever hurt me. I don't care if he spit venom all over. There's a, there's a divide. You know, that is just how saved and secure one of the Lord's people is based upon Christ being his strength and being his refuge and being, as it says here, that shadow from the heat or the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. You know, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a comfort. The, the Lord may have passed by <laughs> the whole world and laid his life down for this poor sinner. But you know what? It would have taken the same death to save this poor sinner as if there were one or if there were a, a thousand because of what God's justice required. But that's why he's our strength. If he died for us, he's, he's our strength. And then verse 5 says, Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers, there are many things that can disturb our peace without destroying us. You know, the noise of strangers. I believe in uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, he talks about a, coming to a place where there's two lines on either side of the path. And at first he halts because these are lions. They're roaring. Just like Satan goes about like a a lion seeking whom he may devour. But then, as he observes more closely, what does he observe? The chain. They can't get to him. Walks right through the middle. I believe that's the sense. Thou shalt bring down the noise of the strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. That's all it is, is noise. Can our conscience sometimes be our enemy? A lot of times. Our sin, as our mind brings it up before us, yeah. Can others? Well, they're the first to see your weaknesses. Point them out to you. Satan? How about the law? Reading the law. Reading some of these portions uh, that, that, that thou shalt and thou shalt not. When you read them, what does it do? Does it cause you to try to run to your own obedience? There's no help there points us to Christ. And in that, he brings down the noise of our enemy. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. I'm thankful that it's that way. I'm thankful by God's grace that he is the God who he is, one who's true 
and one who's faithful. And I'm thankful for his precious promises that he has given us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to whom we run as he gives us the grace. All right.